Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. scripture comes from the book, the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 13, and I have to give you a little setup for this. You remember that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and the Lord delivered them by his might, and um, at the time of this reading, they are getting ready to enter the promised land. So they're out of Egypt and ready to see the land. The Lord said to Moses, Send men out to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving you, giving to the Israelites. From each of their ancestral tribes you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord, all of them leading men among the Israelites. Moses sent them to, and I'm continuing in verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up there into the Negev and go into the hill country and see what the land is like and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land they live in is good or bad, and whether the towns they live in are unwalled or fortified, and whether the land is rich or poor and whether there are trees in it or not. Be bold and bring some fruit of the land. Now it was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rahab near Lebohamoth. They went up to the Negev and came to Hebron, and Ahinamon, Sheshai, and Talmai, the Anakites, were there. Hebron was built seven years after Zoan in Egypt. And they came to Wadi Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. That place was called Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster the Israelites had cut down there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of Israel, the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of that land. And they told us, they told them, we came to the land which you sent us. It does indeed flow with milk and with honey, and this is its fruit. Yet the people who live in the land are strong and the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the land of the Negev. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once to occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against those people, for they are stronger than we. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land they had spied out, saying, The land we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And the people we saw there are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakites come from the Nephilim. Those were the giant people. And to ourselves, we seemed 
like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson comes from Matthew's Gospel. Hear the words of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, I'm going to start with something you may not know about me. Did you know that I used to be a spy? Seriously. I, for a living, what I did for a couple of decades was I snooped around on people, asking a lot of questions, observing behavior and the market conditions with the goal of making recommendations for business opportunities. So, no, I wasn't actually called a spy. I wasn't a 007, but I was a researcher. Like the spies in the story I read to you from Numbers today, I was deployed to gather information. I was tasked with discerning the meaning of that information, and then I was part of a team that made decisions about what came next. This is how new products are developed and old ones are rejuvenated through this process of watching consumer attitudes and behaviors. So, today in our story, God tells Moses to gather leaders from the 12 tribes of Israel and to send them into the promised land ahead of the people to do some research. So Moses deploys them with a pile of questions. What is the land like? Is it any good for farming? What are the people like? What do they do for a living? What are the cities like? Are they fortified with walls around them or are they open? The spies were to ask questions, to observe the conditions and consider the challenges and the opportunities that lay ahead in the land the Lord promised to them as an inheritance. So out they go. This won't be an easy trip. They travel a total distance of around 500 miles in 40 days and 40 nights. And when they return, they provide a rather factual summary. The land, just as the Lord said, it flows with milk and honey. And here is some of its amazing fruits, grapes that must have been this big. Um, the people that live there, yes, they're powerful. Their cities are fortified. Um, the people are large. Some of the people are giant, in fact, and there are many people scattered throughout the land, many different people groups. So they have uh, turned over the rocks in the promised land like they were supposed to. And what have they discerned? Caleb boldly says, let's go take possession of the land. Certainly we can do it. But there were 11 others, and 10 of those 11 did not agree with Caleb and his friend Joshua. They said, there is no way we can go in and take that land from those people. They're big. They're giants. And then the 10 began to do something subversive. They begin talking with their friends and when they're with their neighbors about, what, about their fears of going into the promised land. They say, those people are stronger than me. we are. They're huge. And the land, did you catch this? It actually devours people. Of course, this fearful talk spread through like wildfire through the community, and soon the whole of Israel is gripped with fear. If you continue reading in the book of Numbers, you'll see that the people are in a tizzy, basically. They say, if only we had stayed in Egypt, how soon they forgot that in Egypt they were slaves. So Joshua, 
and Caleb and Moses and Aaron beg the people to stop their rebellion. They say to them, and Joshua says to them, the land we pass through is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into this land, a land that flows with milk and honey and give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. But the people, being the people, threatened to stone Joshua and Caleb and Moses and Andrew. Ten of the twelve spies went from what seemed to be a frank, honest assessment of conditions in the land to insisting that the risks are just too great for the people to move forward. There are giants in the land. The land itself devours people. Truly, this is one of the saddest episodes in the history of Israel. The people well knew their purpose. They knew that the purpose of their having been brought up out of Egypt toward the promised land was so that they could enter the land the Lord promised to them, so that they could be a holy people and a light to the nations, a holy, God's holy people among the pagan people. But because these people let their fears get the best of them, God allowed them to wander in the wilderness for 38 years more. You may remember that it was only Joshua and Caleb um, and anyone who was under the age of 20 at the time of that rebellion who actually entered the promised land. God had big plans for God's people. But the people dissolved in fear. Their faith faltered, and they willingly abandoned God's purpose for them. So I want to share with you something I learned in my former life as a a consumer attitude and behavior spy or a researcher. And it's just how fundamental our need for security is to our personhood. Um, We have seen our need for security played out. We see it every day on the news, honestly, but especially with these two hurricanes that have just come through. Everything is about keeping people safe, and that is wonderful. It's a great instinct in light of what we knew about those storms. Now, in my former profession, though, we studied um, people's motivation to select one product over another. And we used a technique that we called laddering. And the goal of laddering is to find the ultimate emotional benefit to the consumer of choosing one product over another. For several years, I worked on salad dressing. Now, you might not attach any emotional significance to your choice of a salad dressing. You buy a salad dressing because it makes your salad taste better, right? But if you talk to folks long enough about the reasons behind why they buy one particular salad dressing over another, you will learn that they'll say things like, well, I want other people to know that I care about quality, or I want my family to know that I care about them, or honestly, I'm running out of money and I'm afraid, you know. So this product is the cheapest. It's what I buy. Now, what is so interesting about this laddering exercise is that no matter what product category you ladder with people and try to find these emotional benefits in, um, the highest order, the highest level benefit is always the same. And I'll bet you know what I'm going to say. It's security. Fundamentally, people make the choices they make often because it makes them feel secure. Secure that they're safe, secure that they won't look silly, secure that they won't be embarrassed, secure that they won't blow an important opportunity. In our consumer culture, we um, often view the things we buy as a security net. Now, in those days, well before I ever thought about becoming a minister, I always wondered, what in the world is the big deal about security? Are we really that insecure as human beings? Can a salad dressing really give us the confidence we need to make it through dinner? I don't know. Um, It's goofy, but 
If you watch advertising very closely, you will see this played out all over the place. Um, many of you may remember a Subaru ad that's run a lot in recent years. There is a parent and a small ch little child, and they're buckling up into the Subaru. And you know that the, the dad or the mom cares about the child, keeping the child safe. And so they drive a Subaru, and then in the very next scene, you have a teenager behind the same child, all grown up, driving out on their own in, you guessed it, a Subaru. Now, the tagline of that ad says, nothing says love like a Subaru. But y'all know what it means. Nothing says safe like a Subaru. We are security-loving people, and our emotions often drive our choices. Often I think we're not totally aware of just how insecure we may be feeling. So what does this mean for us so many years later? And why in the world did I make such a career change from concerning myself with making people feel secure in their purchase decisions to eternal security in Jesus Christ. Here is my confession. Here's what I learned from my former life as a spy. There is always good fruit to be had in the land, and there are always giants out there too. What I learned from my days in marketing is that those who let their fear of the giants drive them will eventually cave in fear and become irrelevant. Other people will take the necessary risks to succeed. You know, it was true of the Israelites too. God wanted them to grow and to thrive in the promised land, but they feared the giants. And they bore the consequences of their fear. They stayed there in that wilderness a long, long time. But I think this episode in the life of Israel illustrates something really basic, a basic truth about God. God always calls God's people to step out in faith. Often, our fears paralyze us. Fear paralyzes, but faith mobilizes. The story of the spies speaks a word of truth to you here at First Presbyterian Church. You're not as large as you were when I was a teenager in the 70s growing up at this church, are you? And you are not the only church. Many things have changed in our world in these last decades. I have not been around this church too much in the last 35 years, but my guess is that you all have your share of fears. Perhaps you fear that you may not know how to make the good old gospel story relevant to a new generation of people. Perhaps you fear the effects of changing cultural and moral values. I do. Perhaps you fear that your days of influence are over. There are giants in the land, and sometimes we feel like grasshoppers. But I don't think that our fears lead us to an accurate assessment of what is actually happening. You know they never do. We still follow the same God who brought the Israelites out of slavery by his mighty hand and raised Jesus from the dead. That God still calls us today to faithfulness, to what has been entrusted to us. We are to be salt and we are to be light in the place God has placed us. The story reminds us that we have choices to make. The choice between courageous action and cowering in fear, the choice between faith and a big God or whatever small gods we might make for ourselves as we seek to feel safe and in control, the choice between doing things the way we've always done them or trying something new. And as Jane just expressed to you on behalf of the, the pastor nominating committee, the choice between prayerful discernment and expedience. I'd opt for prayerful discernment. 
This is true of your life as a church and your personal lives, but it helps me to remember this when I become afraid. Jesus is not in the fear business. Jesus is in the fruit business. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me will bear much fruit. Because apart from me, he said, you can really not do much of anything. The promise is there for us today. If we remain tethered to Jesus, fruit will be born among us. I think the long history of this church testifies to this. The history of this church testifies to God's faithfulness through changing and challenging times. I once read in a book on stewardship something that has always stuck with me about the church, about the church of Christ. This author wrote, the only product the church offers is changed lives. I look around and I see the work of God in this congregation. Lives are changing. Now, about 17 years ago, when I was in the midst of a few big life changes of my own, this story in Numbers 13 was given to me by a wise friend as a gift. This was a time when I was quite certain the Lord was calling me to go to seminary, and I was quite certain that I could do no such thing. I remember sitting in his office and listing my fears one after another, saying, I just moved here to Huntsville, Alabama from Chicago. When I was in Chicago, there were two seminaries within 10 miles of my home. And by the way, did you notice I have small children? If I have to travel to go to seminary, who's going to take care of those little guys? Eric's job was not in that town. It was 40 miles away. What would happen if they broke a leg or, you know, I was needed, and on and on I went, and the rest is history. I can say with confidence that I know something of God's provision for God's people when they are facing times of fear and indecision. I know you do too. So, just as my friend encouraged me with this story, I give you this story as a gift to contemplate what it means for you and to consider how the Lord is calling you into a new season of fruitfulness. You've got to be discerning. You've got to do your homework. How is it that the Lord would have you go and make disciples and bear fruit? You've got to allow the Spirit of God to deploy you Jesus told his disciples and us it would not be easy. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. He said, you've got to be as shrewd as snake and as innocent as doves. But you, I'll always be with you. The Spirit is always with us. So you've got to be discerning. You've got to let yourself be deployed. And then you're just going to have to decide. How is it that God is calling you to share the love and the mercy of grace of Jesus Christ with a new generation? Be mindful. Fear paralyzes. Faith mobilizes. The gospel powerfully propels the church forward with the leadership of the Holy Spirit into new opportunities. Because I'm telling you, the need for the hope and the security and the, re the uh, reconciliation and the grace and the peace we know in Jesus Christ is needed so much out there in this world today. The only product you have to offer is changed lives. We trust that God is ahead of us. Christ is with us. And the Holy Spirit is working in and through us as we go. Alleluia and amen. It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.